Please stand to your feet. Uh, out of love, respect, and esteem for the public reading of God's word. The title of my message this morning, Choose Sides from Watching to Winning. I'll be reading from Genesis 37, beginning in verse one. Here is the word of the Lord. And Jacob dwelt in the land of wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. And there are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age and he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. And Joseph dreamed a dream and he told it to his brethren and they hated him even more. Let us pray, Father, we come to you today and we thank you for the life of Joseph. There are 30 individual instances in his life where it preaches and teaches us about Christ because he was a true historical figure but was a type of Christ in so many ways. But Lord, we want to focus in on how Joseph, this incredible man of faith, man of God, had a dream. He dreamed a dream and how significant that was for his life and for our lives today. I pray that you would bless this message, give us ears to hear and hearts to receive it. It's in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that I pray. And everyone said, amen, you may be seated. So in a world where screens dominate our attention, <laughs> our sermon today, Choose Sides from Watching to Winning, challenges each of us to step off the sideline and actively engage in God's grand vision for our lives. To not merely be a consumer of the dreams and successes of others as we watch them from this side of the screen. But why not be on the other side of the glass? Why not live out the dream that God has for your life? Why not in the last days, Daniel eleven thirty two says, they that know their God shall carry out great exploits. Why not carry out the exploits of God in your generation so that others are watching and reading about you? instead of us always being on this side of the screen. Choose sides. So today's sermon, I hope, will inspire you to break free from many times the passive patterns of excessive screen time, which can drain us of our joy and of our health and waste our time to enter into a more meaningful existence in the real world, connecting with God in the real world while we grow spiritually. Talking about screen addiction, I read a study recently that said, the more you watch TV, it actually causes your brain to shrink, which explains why I saw a Gen Zer ask Siri, what is two plus two while holding a calculator? And look, Siri just came up. I got it, yeah. Yeah, okay, I'm, I'm not, I need to turn her off, see? Big brother's always listening. The power of a dream. It says in verse five, I mean, the entire life of Joseph can be a 12 week study. It's absolutely beautiful. 30 different instances, his, his life is a type of Jesus Christ and points to Christ. But in that one verse, verse five, it says that Joseph had a dream. Joseph, at the age of 17, what set him apart, which caused others to hate him, because it was because he had a dream. Joseph had a dream. Do you have a dream? There's such power in a dream from God for your life. Do people even dream anymore in America or have the naysayers stolen that from us also, right? We used to talk about what? The American dream. Now we talk about the American grind. Now all we can do is complain about living in America. We traded our dreams for meaningless activities, our aspirations for a ceaseless scrolling on social media, making unwise comparisons. It's time to reclaim the inspiration of you, yourself, dreaming big. Joseph had a dream. Do you have a dream? I hope you have a dream. If you don't have a dream, you can find God's dream for your life. This sermon will help nudge you in that direction. You know, the American dream once stood for what? Hope that through hard work, perseverance, and a little bit of luck for Christians, a lot of faith, that anyone could achieve their own version of success. That is, in a nutshell, the American dream. It was about owning a home, having a stable job, creating a better life for your children. 
It was a dream built on the values and opportunities of freedom, a meritocracy, of upward mobility. And oh, by the way, did you know that is extremely biblical? What I just read is extremely biblical. In Jeremiah 29, verses four through seven, while God's children, the Israelites, were living in Babylon as exiles, God, through the prophet Jeremiah, told them that they were to build houses, they were to settle down, they were to plant gardens, they were to get married, and they were to seek the prosperity of the city in which they were living in. Because God said, if you work for the peace and prosperity of that city, as that city prospers, you will prosper. Isn't that powerful? That was like 2,700 years ago. That is a strategy for success while living in exile. We're living this side of eternity. We're not in heaven yet. We're looking for that city whose builder and maker is God, as it says concerning Abraham, who built his, his altars and pitched his tents. We're not here to build tents and pitch altars. We're here to pitch tents and build altars. We know that we're simply sojourners passing through, but while we are here, we are to seek for the betterment of society. We're to seek for the prosperity of our nation, and we are to be a force for good and healing and wholeness till Christ comes. The power of a dream. Joseph dreamed a dream. He didn't say Joseph had a thought. There's nothing wrong with having a thought, okay? But it doesn't say Joseph had a thought. It doesn't say Joseph had a plan. Nothing wrong with having a plan. He that fails to plan, plans to fail. Many times we fail because we don't have a plan. Many times we fail because we have the wrong plan. Nothing wrong with a plan. But people that make the world a better place, people that change the world, they don't simply have a thought, a whim, a wish, a plan. They have a dream. He didn't have a suggestion. He didn't have an idea. He had a dream. Joseph had this vivid, compelling vision. Within the dream was a vision. The vision was wrapped up in this dream that he had. And it was a dream, undeniably from God, of what he would become, of what he would do to save the people of God. You see, people that change the world, people that make the world a better place, they're all inspired by a dream. It's no coincidence, Martin Luther King Jr., the greatest speech, scratch that, the greatest sermon, one of the greatest sermons ever preached in the history of the world, not just in the United States of America, was when he stood up and he said, I have a dream. He didn't say, I have a plan, I have a strategy. He had a dream. He envisioned, he saw a vision, a future where people would be judged, not by the color of their skin, but the content of their character. Whoa, a dream that launched the civil rights movement, a dream that changed the world. Well, Disney, he had a dream. He dreamed of creating a magical world of entertainment and joy for families. Now that dream is becoming a nightmare in many respects. Steve Jobs, he had a dream. He dreamed to integrate technology seamlessly into everyday life. And his heirs are enjoying the fulfillment of that dream floating around in a $120 million yacht. Dreams can come true. A dream, what's your dream? Friend, if your only dream is winning the lottery, I would encourage you, trade that in for a up, upgrade, upsize your dream. Amen. Now, listen, I hope you win the lottery, but in the meantime, get a job. In the meantime, work hard. In the meantime, work towards a dream. And dream, dream a dream. Just don't dream so much that you sleep through your alarm clock and miss church on Sunday morning. Amen. Like those of you watching online right now, you should be here. Come on. Time for the 1115 service. Be here live, nothing like being here live, amen. Dreams, dreams push us to look beyond our circumstances, to envision a brighter, better future. Joseph needed a dream, why? At 17, his brothers tried to kill him. Kill him. At the 17, his brother sold him as a slave. He ends up in Egypt. He had to have a dream to endure the hardship and the suffering. Don't think a dream is going to come true without sorrow. No dream, if it's from God, will ever materialize without pain and suffering. But on the other side of that pain and suffering, on the other side of, that hard, of the hardship and the trials, there is a glorious living out the dream of God for your life that won't only benefit you because a dream from God is not just about you and your life, us four and no more being benefited, but a dream that's from God will be a blessing to many, many others. 
for generations to come in Jesus' name. Proverbs 29, 18, all of us should have this verse, at least the first part memorized, but let's read the first part out loud together. Where there is no vision, the people perish. One more time. Where there is no vision, the people perish. A whole generation of young people are perishing. They don't have a vision. So many people are merely existing, surviving instead of thriving. Why? They've lost their vision or they've never had one. I'm not talking about a man-made vision. I'm not talking about man-made dreams. I'm talking about a dream from God. I'm talking about a, a vision of God that once you have a vision of God, you can receive a vision from God for your life that defines and brings meaning to your life, that gives you an answer to the most important question that people ask, why? Why am I here? What's the meaning of life? It's only after you give your life to Christ. And then you begin to discover his plan for your life. And you begin to live out his plan for your life that all of a sudden you realize this is my why. This is why I get up. This is why we face the challenges and the hardships and the setbacks that all of us face from time to time because Joseph dreamed a dream. And you are dreaming a dream. So which side of the glass do you want to live on? You know, the average young person today spends a significant amount of time in front of this screen or TV screen or a computer screen. Matter of fact, according to recent data, teenagers here in the United States, they spend about seven and a half hours per day, per day on screens, just for entertainment purposes. Activities like watching TV, using social media, playing video games, browsing the web. A third of your life being consumed by living on this side of the glass instead of the other side of the glass. The glass. This figure actually does not even include screen time spent on educational activities such as school, work, homework, and the such. For children ages 8 to 12, the average daily screen time is almost five hours. While children ages 5 to 8 spend over three hours a day on screens. I mean, oh, uh, parents, and I know it's hard, it's hard, it's the hardest time to be a parent, but th this is not the babysitter. You cannot let this become the iPad, become the babysitter for your children. We have to monitor the time and their exposure to this technology. I'm not saying all this technology is bad and evil and we need to do away with it. I, I, I love this technology for the right purposes. I, I started preaching here in 2001. Every sermon I've ever preached is on this phone right here. I can access it. As long as me, Jesus, and this phone, or anywhere in the world I could preach any sermon <laughs> that I've ever preached, because it, it's all right here. I have uh, about 20,000 books in my, my, uh, my theological library, 20,000. They can all be accessed right here. They're all digitized, all, they're all digital, right? I mean, there's just so much good that this can be used, and yet so much bad, right? The images that we should not be viewing, the things we should not be viewing, the radicalization that happens in the hearts and minds of many young people, the propaganda, the lies. It's a tool that could be used for the glory of God or a tool that can be used for the enemy. So what do we do? Three things in closing. Number one, choose the active side of the glass, okay? Choose the active side of the glass. Discover the dream of God for your life, the vision, the purpose whether it's going to school right now or starting a career, a business, a ministry, a nonprofit, or simply, not simply, but, but prioritizing family and, and staying at home and raising this next generation. Whatever it is, it's important. Nothing is unimportant. Whatever you do, do for the glory of God. See purpose in all that you do. The great Viktor Frankl, Dr. Viktor Frankl survived the Nazi death camps. He, he wrote great, great literature. He said something so profound. He said, don't try to find the meaning of life, but bring meaning to life. Don't try to find the meaning of life, but bring meaning. If you're flipping burgers, bring meaning to that. You can do that for the glory of God. So choose the active side of the glass. Colossians 3.23, let's read it out loud together. Whatever you do, do it wholeheartedly as though you were working for your real master and not merely for humans. <laughs> Whatever you do means what? Whatever you do. Whatever you do. If you're in the backyard picking up the dog poop, whatever you do, do it wholeheartedly. Don't leave even one little piece. <laughs> Flies will gather. The stench will grow. Scrape it all up. Throw it all away. And do it for the glory of God. Because you work 
for one master. That's why, as long as your job is not immoral, illegal, or illicit, whatever you do, it is a platform, it is your ministry, it is your domain, it is your kingdom. You bring the sacred into the secular and you do it as unto the Lord for the glory of God. Because you're living not on simply this side of the screen, but on the right side of the screen. Number two, let's unmask the digital trap. What is happening to this generation you know, we say, we say, the Bible says, without a vision, the people perish. Young people say, without Wi-Fi connection, I perish. Because there's such a strong addiction to technology today. Jean, Dr. Jean Twinge, in her, in her recent book uh, and in her research, she shows that the excessive screen time is linked to increased depression and anxiety. Even suicide rates among Generation Z is at all-time high. It's like they're living a digital version of the Hunger Games. But instead of fighting to the death, they are fighting to get the most likes on Instagram or the most views on TikTok. It's maddening, it's crazy. But the battle for the soul of young people is real. And we must be alerted to it as, as parents and as adults. So in the Old Testament, the prophet Elijah was one of the greatest prophets that ever lived some of the greatest miracles ever performed that, that God had ever performed through, through a human being was done through the prophet Elijah. He had just accomplished a tremendous victory. Something like 900 prophets of Baal and Asherah were defeated on the holy mount when he called fire down from heaven and a sacrifice was devoured. And then he got word that, that, that Jezebel, the queen, was going to kill him that very day and he fled and, and he just, he, he hit a wall. It can happen to, to the best of us. He, his tank was empty. And it says in 1 Kings 19, 4, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and he came and sat down under a broom tree and he prayed that he might die. He simply did not want to live anymore. You've been there, right? We've all, to a certain degree, have been there. And he said, it's enough. I can't take it anymore. He says, now Lord, take my life. I'm no better than my father's. And it's a powerful story. The Lord, through an angel, came, a divine messenger came and, and, and ministered to him. And, and, and he, he, he found a place of recovery, but he never really fully recovered. It's shortly after that, that God took him to heaven in a chariot of fire. But there are so many people that are suffering with anxiety and depression, more so this generation than before, especially amongst the young people. And, and, it's, and, and adults are not immune to it either. And it really intensified uh, during COVID when there was a mass shutdown and schools were shut down and kids were isolated and suicide rates have, have been up since that moment. But there's hope because Joseph dreamed a dream and this generation needs to find their God-given dream. And we as parents and adults and churches need to help young people find and discover their God-given dream so they could live out that God-given dream for the glory of God because without a vision, the people perish. <laughs> Psalm 34, 18, such a beautiful promise. It says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. If you're here today and you're suffering from a broken heart, friend, the Lord is close. As I said in, in my worldview segment last weekend on the origin of consciousness and, and the conscience and how St. Augustine said, famous quote, God is closer to you than you are to yourself. He's close to the brokenhearted. And put that verse up. And he saves those who are crushed in spirit. If your spirit is feeling crushed by the times in which we are living in, no, turn to the Lord. You see, Joseph endured such injustice. He endured such hatred. And yet he had a dream. And that dream is what allowed him to, to go through life almost unscathed. When his dream became a reality, he was not full of revenge and bitterness, but joy and happiness. Number three, in closing, how do you dream a dream? Let me give you some practical steps. If you don't have a dream, here, here's how you can get a dream from God. Number one, seek God's will through prayer. Begin to seek God about the meaning, how you can bring meaning to your life. Discovering what it is that you want me to do with the short time that I have in this world, God. Begins with prayer. 
One of my favorite verses of all time, Jeremiah 33, three, the first, one of the first Bible verses I ever memorized. Let's read it out loud together. Call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. I prayed that every day of my life, 44 years ago when I first gave my life to Christ because I, I, I knew what I didn't know and I didn't know anything. And I needed God's wisdom. And God is faithful. He will show you. Sometimes it comes all at once. Sometimes it's, a, it's through a process but you have to seek God. Number two, you have to immerse yourself in scripture. <laughs> Let's read Psalm 119, 105 together out loud. Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. This book is a supernatural book. This book is of divine origin. There is no other book like this in the world. That's why this book is hated. Try to open this book up in a public school and read from it, you'll be arrested. Definitely fired. This book is banned from whole nations a whole part of the world, they will kill you if you read from this book. China bans this book. What is it about this book that causes such angst and such fear and such hatred? It's God's word. It is of supernatural origin. And if you will begin to immerse yourself in this, there's healing in this book. There is wisdom in this book. God is revealed to us through this book book. And Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone, but every word, every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You want a dream from God, you got to begin to pray and cry out to God and seek God. You need to immerse yourself in scripture. Number three, surround yourself with godly counsel. Proverbs 15, 22, let's read it out loud together. Plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. You know, I've never made a major decision in my life without getting counsel. To this day, I've got great counselors. I'm part of a board of elders. These men, in many respects, are wiser than me, uh, more experienced than me in many, in many other fields, in many other ways. And we never make an important decision without seeking God and then wise advice, wise counsel. I've never made a major financial decision. I've never made an important decision in my life without getting counsel. I have always sought out wise men and a wise woman named Gloria, wise men and wise women, before I've made important decisions in life. And it has served me well. The times that I have done dumb things is because <laughs> I made the decision pretty much on my own in a multitude of counselors. Now, not, not dumb counselors, not a spirit of dumb like I preached on last week, but, but wise counselors. So take your plans. And then your dreams and your hopes, because you know, you, you have to have a dream that gives you a vision, and then you gotta have a plan, and then you have to set goals, and, and, and you know, goals are steps to the, to the ultimate fulfillment of the dream, and there's that whole process you're familiar with. But it needs wise counsel. Number four, use your God-given gifts and talents. You know, we all have gifts and all have talents, and that's why whatever you do, whatever you're good at, you, you, you can't take credit for it. It's God's gift upon your life. Now. You've been faithful with that gift. You've been a steward with that gift. Paul told Timothy, stir up the gift of God that's within you. Some of you have gifts and you're not using them right now. And I challenge you to let the Holy Ghost stir up those gifts that are within you. But everyone in here, everyone in here has at least one gift. Some of you have multiple gifts. And yes, I'm jealous of you. I've got like one gift or two maybe. Some people, they've got gift upon gift. I'm like, God, why did you give them so many gifts? And why do I have so few gifts? Some of you have a gift to sing and you never sing. I, I wish I had that. I, I've prayed this prayer. I said, God, they're not using it. Give it to me. Now, I, I think I can sing pretty good. I hear myself and I'm like, you're, you're, you're actually pretty good, girl. But I'm, I also suffer from an inflated ego, right? Like, like most of us. <laughs> but, but we all have to, here, here, let's read Romans 12, six out loud together. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. Your gift is given to you by the grace of God. Whatever, whatever, and, and multiple gifts given to you by the grace of God, but now you need to do something with that gift. Are you using that gift for the glory of God? Number five, stay committed and persevere. Why? Because really, if you have a dream from God, it's only gonna be fulfilled through much sorrow, pain, and suffering. I don't know why, but that's the story. Before the crown, there's the cross. Before the blessing, there's the burden. That's a pattern in scripture from Genesis to Revelation. 
It's a pattern in the life of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It'll be no different from you. So the people that try to peddle, dream a dream, and it'll all be, you know, sunshine and lollipops, they're not, they're not telling you the whole story. But don't give up. Why? Look at Galatians 6, 9. Let's read it out loud together. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we don't what? If we don't what? I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, don't give up. Go on, tell him, don't give up. Don't give up. Hold on to the dream. It's for an appointed time. Kairos, not chronos. That Greek word is kairos. It's a time in which God could do more for you in one day than you could ever accomplish in a thousand years. It is a God moment. And those moments come in our life. Many times, not when we want them to, but when God wants them to. And his, his plan is perfect. Our understanding of it sometimes is imperfect, but his plan is perfect. But the promise is real if you'll meet the condition. Don't get discouraged. Your due season is about to come. Harvest will come. You simply can't give up. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Oh, come on. We're going to thank the Lord. Let's thank the Lord together. Come on. Every, all right. All right, every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, we humbly come before you today. A sacred moment in scripture, Joseph dreamed a dream. May we dream a dream, your dream for our life. And may we not let go of it. Some have lost their dream. I pray that they would reclaim God's dream for their life today by the power of the Holy Spirit. Some have yet to dream a dream. And I pray that you would birth a dream in their heart and it begins by them having a vision of who you are, your glory and power at work in their lives. And I thank you that we're not gonna be weary and well-doing for in due season we will reap if we don't faint, if we don't quit, if we don't throw in the tail. I pray for those that may be battling depression, for those that have a broken heart. Jesus, you've come to heal the broken heart and bind up their wounds. And I pray that the healing balm of Gilead through the preaching of the scripture under the anointing of the Holy Spirit would bring healing and blessing in people's lives today and those that are watching online. Now with heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you want to go to heaven, you must be born again. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. It's a prayer of repentance and faith towards God. If you'll say this prayer with your own mouth and mean it from your own heart, Christ will come into your life and change your life from the inside out. And if you're a Christian already, but you're backslidden, let this be for you a prayer of rededication. Here we go. Dear God in heaven, I know I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. There's only one Savior. His name is Jesus. I call upon you, Jesus. I ask you now, come into my heart, come into my life, be my Lord and be my savior. I turn from sin to the true and living God. I receive his love, his grace, and his forgiveness. Dear God in heaven, you're now my father and I am your child. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit and give me strength to live for you and serve you all the days of my life, beginning today for the rest of eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise. Can we do that?